Today we recited in Halle that uh, Kol Goyim Savuni, chapter 118 of Tehillim. All the nations around me, B'Shem Hashem Ki Amilam, in the name of God, I will cut them off. Then we say, Sapuni Gam Savuni. They encircle me in two ways. You can say there's a, a, a close circle to us, which is a reference, as the sages say in the Midrash, this is a reference to the wars of Gog and Magog on the land of Israel. So the close ones are our nearest neighbors who surround us and they want to destroy us, but in the name of Hashem, which means loving kindness, and also dedication to Torah, it's also the name of Hashem, and having trust in Him, as mentioned in the previous verses. This can save us from the nations that surround us on our borders. Gamsa Vuni is a reference to those that are further afield, even from Iran and other places, that also threaten us for destruction. B'Shem Hashem Kamilam, with the name of Hashem, we can cut them off. Then it says, Sabuni Chidavoyrim, Doachu Keish Kotzim, B'Shem Hashem Kamilam. They surround me like bees. And that is, with the other place in the Chumash where this is mentioned, this is the way of Amalek, that they don't mind killing themselves in order to kill others. Suicide bombers are referred to like bees. Because bees, when they sting, they die. And similarly, also, we're surrounded by threats and sometimes, unfortunately, actual attacks of suicide bombers and destroy themselves at the same time they destroy the innocent people. That B'Shem Hashem is we say Ki Amilam. But Doachu Ke'esh Kotzin used to take it as a metaphor, as a figure of speech. They squeeze out with the fire of thorny weeds. Well, this is the fires, which have now been proven that very many of these fires, these are intentional arson. And that's, so in this verse we have what's taking place now. Two things, kidvorim and like and light the fire. That doesn't even, it doesn't even say like, it says, they oppress us with the fires. They begin to spread over the forest, which means really they don't care for Eretz Israel. They don't care for the land that they themselves wanted. So that's, uh, that is another matter of, we see, that is a premonition. <coughs> In the words of the prophets, Tehillim was also written by Ruach HaKodesh, by David HaMelech, you see, becoming fulfilled. But B'Shem Hashem Ki Amilam, He will save me. And then the next verses speak about the way in which the redemption will come. We say, Lo amur ki echye we, The Jewish people, however much they want to destroy us, we will live to declare the glories of Hashem and reach the day, they are young, this is the day when Hashem has so saved us Nagila Manisam Khapo, that's the day we're waiting for, for the final redemption. Now <clears throat> I want to point out uh, a very significant aspect of Masa Vatsiman Levanim, which <clears throat> is is hinted at in the in the Chumash, what happened to the forefathers, is expounded in the Midrash in a manner that has never been fulfilled so concretely as in our time. And that is the following statement made by the Midrash. It's used in connection with what it says in the forthcoming Pasha that when Yaakov Avinu came to Shechem, then it says, <coughs> that he purchased a portion of the field with a hundred 
um, valuable silver coins. And also refer to this later on, the purchase of a portion of land in Shechem, when he says, I shall akachti miyadre mori, ani yotein lecha shechem achad olachecha, as mentioned in connection with Yosef. And Shechem, we know, was a central city. In fact, when it says Avram came to Eretz Kena'an, then he came to Shechem first. Shechem really means the shoulder. Is as it were, the shoulder, which <coughs> in the body of man divides the head from the body. And it's like the, you can say, the borderline of the southern kingdom with the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, which contained the bit, the contained the bit, bit amikdash, ultimately, is the head. And the body is the whole northern kingdom. Unfortunately, in Shechem, that was the place of division. That was the place also where the brothers of Yosef, they, they plotted to, to harm him. First to kill, then to, then to sell him as a slave. This was the split between the brothers, and also the split of the northern and the southern kingdom. And Shechem was also the place well, on one side was Ha Gerizim, on the other side was Ha Ebal, mentioned later. So I'll tell you what the Midrash says on this. It says, Vayike Lechakata Tzadeh. It says that this is one of the three places where the nations of the world have no possibility to accuse the people of Israel to say, you have stolen it from us. You've taken occupied territory. Which we know from the beginning of our whole series, that's also mentioned right near the first verse of the Chumash, of the Midras. But there are three places where they can have no claim at all. Now what are these three places? They are, the, the first one is, the cave of Machpelah, which was purchased by Avram Avinu with a very heavy price. So, this part, the parcel of land is one of the three places. They can't say, you've stolen it from us by theft. The cave of Machpelah and the place of the temple, the Harabite, and the grave of Yosef. The grave of Yosef was in Shechem. <coughs> so it says, it says, it says, in, it says as follows. The cave of Machpelah, as it is written, the beginning of Pasha Chayesoro, and Avraham listened to Evron, and he weighed out to Evron the price that he had mentioned in the hearing of the children of Chet, 400 silver shekels in negotiable currency, and the front field was in Machpelah facing Mamre. The field and the cave within it was confirmed as Avraham's. The second one is Beit Hamikdash. Because what happened? David Amelech, he had actually conquered most of Eretz Israel in many different battles. I mean, as previously Yeshua had done, but at this time he had to also have further battles. But one place that the people of Israel did not conquer, not in the time of Yeshua, and not afterwards, he, he purchased the area of the Temple Mount, the place of the Temple. It says, David gave Ornan to whom it belonged. He was a Yehusite. And Amisrael did not attack this place. But David gave honor for the place gold checkers weighing 600. So each tribe had to participate in 600 gold checkers, worth a great deal. And Ornan um, was a Jebusite, a member of one of the seven Canaanite nations, who became a Geto a resident convert, who renounced idolatry and accepted the seven Noahide laws. After purchasing the place mentioned in the verse cited here, 
which had been on the threshing floor, King David designated to be the site of the temple, as is described in the book of Chronicles. So this is one place. The other place was the burial place of Yosef, where it says he bought the parcel of land upon which he he pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, of 100 gesitat, which is an enormous amount of money. And ultimately, Yosef was buried there because, for many reasons, because also that was the place where the brothers plotted against him and they sold him into slavery and recognized that that was really a place where miracles occurred to him when they threw him in the pit. Great miracle that he was saved and ultimately they made peace with the brothers. So, it's a very important place. So Yaakov purchased that place. So, so therefore, it turns out that Israel's right to these three locations, which serve as the spiritual focal points of the land, is undisputable. So to understand this more deeply, uh, <coughs> <clears throat> First, let's speak about what Avraham Avinu we all understand. That's, that, is, that is the ultimate act of chesed. The sages say, the greatest chesed shall emet, which is loving kindness which you can't get any reward here on earth because uh, the person who's died can't say thank you to you for what you're doing. And here Avraham Avinu when when Sora died, this really, this really, she died really as a result of the Akeda Jitzchak. You know, now Avraham Avin recognized that Sora was really his mainstay through all his life from the beginning till her death, and the, through her merit to some extent, he was able to be given also for her high level of Ruach HaKodesh indications you shouldn't allow his quality of loving kindness to come to the high, to the extreme point where it would be more than is really permissible. Because chesed, we want to discuss this, chesed, if it is left without boundaries, it can be turned into the opposite. Anything which is not correctly balanced will ultimately create a fall down like the human body even, we know if we don't have balance, we fall down. You can, if you go too far to one side and the other side, you just, just, you just fall down. So this is how chesed can become the opposite as happened with Ishmael, that he used the quality of chesed that he inherited to produce, instead of love, lust, and other things. But the highest chesed was that he went to great extremes to make sure he purchases a plot. And also, this was a bit of a <coughs> test, because Hashem had told him he was going to have the whole land. And here, he didn't have the whole land. He didn't know also what, what was really going to happen in every respect. So he, he did this final chesed. Not the final one, but anyway, for the big chesed, shall emet, to go to extremes and pay enormous amount of money. Though some say they were even offered it, were offering it free of charge, but no, he wanted to purchase it also because he felt that this area needs to be purchased. There should be no claim whatsoever from other nations that does not belong to the people of Israel. And from here we'll come to, to understand the place of the Beit HaMikdash, which also, this is a very deep teaching. It means, because it was purchased, and was not conquered by force, this is the deep explanation of what it says in the Midrashim, and the Rambam brings it for Halakha. He says, the Halakha, a practical point we say, the area which was conquered by Yeshua of Eretz Israel, and then, unfortunately, everything was destroyed through the king of Bovo, and they were all banished. 
So, the, we say that the Kedusha Rishonah, the first holiness, halachically speaking, of the land of Israel, with the borders which Yeshua and his successors in the first kingdom of Am Yisrael, even the second kingdom of David Amela, the time of the first Beit HaMikdash, when it all became destroyed, the holiness, halachically speaking, left the land. And therefore the only land that has Kedusha today is that which was taken over under Ezra and Nehemia, the second Beit HaMikdash. Those are the strict borders for laws of Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael, which means, and you know we have in practical terms, it means that those areas, let's say in the south, which are taken over in the first Beit HaMikdash, because it's extended to wide borders in the time of Shlomo Amela, even to Eilat, that it doesn't have Kedusha today. Because in the second, con it wasn't a conquest, the second taking over of Eretz Israel was, was, was not a conquest. It was, it was supported by the big empire at the time, the superpower, the Persian kings supported the building of the temple. It wasn't taken by force. And therefore it remains forever to the Mashiach, in halachically speaking. But the Rambam says, you shouldn't think that the initial Kedusha of, of the Beit HaMikdash, the place of the Beit HaMikdash, the Harabayit, that that ever became nullified. Because it said that's the place of the Shekhinah, and the place of the Shekhinah never become, never become nullified. And that's what the Rambam halachic statement. Everyone asks the question, if you say the first Kedusha went away, why not on the, on the place, on the Harabayit as well? So, so he said, not the place of the Shekhinah. And they take the hints, the hints that, that the, when it says, it says in the Klala, I'm going to make desolate your holy places. It means even the desolation, the holy place, the Beit HaMikdash remains holy. The Shekhinah that never goes away. Shekhinah is eternal. And you look in the Rambam, different references. His view is, the holiness of the Harabayit was already designated from creation, because that's the place where, where he says, where Adam brought, and Noah brought the offerings, and even before Avraham Avinu came on the scene, but it was, it was, it was stamped with his ultimate holiness by the Arcade of Yitzchak. The Arcade of Yitzchak made this the ultimate place of the Shekhinah. And the Shekhinah never become nullified. So, so, and also, therefore, David Amel also said, we cannot conquer the place of the Beit HaMikdash. We've got to purchase it. Also, the, the other nations should not have a claim that the people of Israel stole it from us. No, it's been dedicated to us from the beginning. The place of the Beit HaMikdash. And the third place of Shechem is similar. That we saw, see also, it was the first place where Avram Avino made uh, Mizbeach near there and called upon the world. He went to Shechem when he came to Eretz Israel. Why? Because this was, as well, the shoulder, the linking point between the north and the south, and also the danger point. But where is it mentioned more clearly? It's mentioned what it really signifies on a deeper level. You see, in the book of Devarim and after the book of Yeshua. Because when Amisor, the command was given, they've crossed the Yardin, one of the first things they had to do was, as it says, beginning of Pastor the A, they had to go and declare the blessing on Hagrizim and the Klala on Har Eval. How did they declare it? The tribes are divided into two groups. And the Rvim were in the valley. Now Shechem is the city in the valley between the two shoulder mountains. Gerizim and Evo, the two mountains on both sides. But the two shoulders are different. One shoulder, the Ha Gerizim, is also called Ha Bracha until today. It's that place which is very fertile. And where the, where the Elonei Mamre, they, 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 they were forests. And today also, it's a fertile area. 
And the Elonim Ore is one of the fertile villages today. And we even the the, the Shambronim made the, the temple there and so on. It's, it's a very fertile area. The other side, it's completely rocky. So it says, with title bracha al klalaha eval. Eval is a rocky mountain. And that divide, and what do they have to say? They have to make a declaration that all Israel are responsible one for the other. And therefore it says, it says in the Chumash, it says, a curse on those who commit secret sins, and a blessing on those who in secret, they still serve Hashem, even when no one's looking. And that was the basis of the, re it's considered like the re-acceptance of the Torah. Am Yisrael, the fact it says that, cursed is the person who doesn't uphold the Torah, and blessed is the person who upholds the Torah. So it was the Torah, as it has to be applied when you go to Eretz Israel, that then, then the responsibility of the nation has to be upheld by every person. And the, like today, today in many uh, constitutions of the nations of the world, there's a difference in private and public morality. They say, well, in public, you've got to keep the certain moral principles. What a person does in private is his own affair. And you can't really interfere with private immoral deeds. And this is a whole debate, one of the basic debates in question of law and morality of today. As far as the Torah state is concerned, we must know that it's the responsibility of the nation to be educated and to accept upon ourselves that the success of the nation depends not only on what you do in public, also what you do in private. And this, play, this, is, this is the Acceptance of Torah to Eretz Israel was took place in Shechem, the two shoulders on the two bold, two hills on both sides. The geography of Eretz Israel is really a spiritual geography as is described in the Chumash. That's why you, whenever you go, even from Mount Everest, and you go to the Am HaMelech, it would be called in the language of the Tanakh, going up, Aliyah, that's Aliyah, and vice versa. It's a big Yerida for a person to go from the Amamelach, the Dead Sea, to go to the Himalayas, or the Rocky Mountains. It's a Yerida, you're going, you're going down. And even on the day, this still remains with us. It's, they are Olim and Yordim. So these three places, so, so therefore it turns out, that these three places represent three principles. And this is a beautiful uh, explanation, <coughs> which is elaborated upon by the Khatam Sofi. He said it like this. We know Shimon Abba put forward an important principle. It's not really his own, as, as even the Bat Nura says, beginning to pick our vote, you should know that the moral principles, the ethics of the fathers, also go back to Sinai. The world is based on three principles. Torah, Avodah, Gemilot, Chasadim. And some say, why is it called Avot? Because Avot means the forefathers, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And they say furthermore, this, as even so, this is a long perush on Pek Avot, which was not, 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 not Tali Grizzly, lengthy perush, where he shows how all the ways we pick our vot, these principles are upheld. In other words, Torah is our relationship with the duties towards ourselves as self-perfection, as much as possible, in holiness. Avodah is our relationship to Hashem, divine service. Our relationship to our fellow man. So you can divide all the duties of the human being in these three categories. There's reaching the height of personal morality and saintliness, <coughs> reaching the height of closeness to Veiko to Hashem, reaching the height of dedication to other people, of loving kindness. That's, that's what we say, Elokei Abraham, Elokei Tzorokei Yaakov. So it's like this. If you, if you look at it, these three holy places represent these three principles. You should have found 
on the Torah, that is Shechem. Because in Shechem, the people had to reunite in the middle of the land, the shoulder between the head and the body, as we explained, that, that all the tribes had to declare, the, say, Omen, on the blessing or on the curse. I mean, they divided in two groups. <coughs> so also, so in order to em emphasize, each tribe has got its specific responsibility. You can even work out <coughs> that there are 12 instances mentioned of secret sins that correspond to, to, to these 12 tribes of Amisla. And, and, and Yaakov Avino said on his deathbed, they have to perform unity. They're in fact, that's when they said, Shema Yisroel, listen, our forefather Yisroel Yaakov, we are all united in accepting Hashem in different ways. Then, then we say Yaakov Avinu was happy. But when he was not so sure there was this unity, his visions of the future left him. But when, when he heard, you, you, he coughed to Vashimu that you're all going to be together, then each one in a different way. But, but working together to create harmony amongst the 12 tribes, that will bring the redemption. So, so this is Torah. Shechem represents Torah taken from Sinai and taken over to be applied in its maximum fashion by the 12 different ways of the 12 tribes that was in Shechem. And then the geography demonstrated you can either have a rocky existence where nothing grows on one side, if you're not going to listen, and if you do listen, you'll have the greatest blessing. What does it depend on? It depends on the inner quality of the ground. If it's rocky, nothing grows. If your heart is rocky, nothing can develop. If on the other hand you've got good earth, then the seeds will sprout into the tree of life. So this is the Torah. And what's the Avodah? Avodah, that's the Beit HaMikdash, the Harabayit. The Harabayit is, is, is the place of Avraham, Gulut Chasadim. No, sorry, that's the place also. It's the place of closest to Hashem. What, even the name Yerushalayim is to add on to Shalem, which has more concept of social harmony, but he added there the concept of Yira. You've got to have a link with Hashem to, to know that Hashem is looking after you. That's the place of the Shekhinah, so that's Avodat Hashem. And the highest point was reached by Yitzchak. But Yitzchak, he had the quality of Avodah, Pachat Yitzchak, constant awareness of Hashem, which accompanied him, especially from the moment that he went through the Akeda, he recognized that the service of Hashem is the most important aspect which brings the Jewish people and, and all, of, all of us to the highest point. That is Avodah. And Gwil Chasadim was shown at its maximum by Avram himself when he purchased Marat HaMachpelah, Chesed Shel Emet. Even the concept of Chesed Shel Emet is mentioned over Eliezer when he's looking for a wife. He says, if, if I, she prays to Hashem, please do with me Chesed Ve'emet. He recognized that Chesed has to be the Shem Shamayim. If you do Chesed and you expect appreciation, then it's not yet clear that you're doing it of the highest motive. But if you get no appreciation, so it shows that you reach the highest level. So that is Chesed Shel Emet is shown by Marat Arach So these are the three Avot linked to these three places which were not conquered by any aspect of force. They, they were purchased with a maximum price, the highest, highest price available. They were willing to pay for all these three places. And it's, a fan, it's a fantastic revelation that today exactly that's what's happening. That's why this Midrash is so important. Mirza says, even the nations of the world, if any of them, they really study history, and as is shown again and again, by all those who perhaps in previous times would have been Bible critics, but today there's so many works of the greatest scholars 
who say there's such accuracy in the Bible. There are many, there are many people also from the Western world, the Christian world, they're starting to look at the Bible in a new manner. Because they see this all the time, there are further and further excavations which prove the scientific, historical accuracy of whatever's mentioned in the Bible. Or there's some texts we don't understand so well. But surely this concept, mentioned in the Chumash, and also we saw in Tibra Yamein Melachim, of these three places, the most holy place of the people of Israel, and this is, was never taken and occupied by any aspect of force. It could only come through peaceful means and teaches us the big principle that Torah represents peace. And the, if you want to look at the problem, you can look at the prophecy given by so many that in the Acharit Hayamim, the end of times, there's going to come a period when the nation will get together and they will recognize this. Like when the Renaissance came and people began to study, non-Jews began to study the, the Old Testament more deeply, making use of Jewish commentators, which brought them also to study the Talmud and the Rambam. So in the Middle Ages, the, due to the founders of international law, the founders of international law with somebody called Selby and others, they were great scholars, and the concept of human rights for all nations, they took from the concept of the Noachide Code, not just the personal code, it's a code how human beings can achieve peace. And from that arose the, 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 the charter developed by the League of Nations, and then also by the, by the United Nations. That's their charter, it's based on that. And the, if you study the charter of the rights of nations and what's called a justified war, and what's called a war that's not justified, you go into all these questions in a fantastic manner. If a person studies it, and I went through it once earlier, you can see this is the basis for creating peace even today, if, if the world would accept it. Unfortunately, the United Nations discussions go entirely against, for many of them, the United Nations Charter being twisted. In fact, in recent times, it was even a Jew who was one of the made, major uh, person who developed also from the League of Nations to the United Nations Charter. But, you know, but uh, now it's become, and I would say that's from that comes the verses from the prophets, then the end of times, all the nations will accept the teachings, it says, of the house of Yaakov from the Temple Mount. They quote those verses. But they recognize that's where it comes from. So, what's the Midrash say? That these three places, nobody can make a claim that they were ever occupied they were ever taken by force, and they were ever stolen. They paid an enormous price for these three places. They should become part and parcel of the holy places in the land for Israel for all generations, till the time comes when the redemption will come. Then, they could, then the holiness will spread. And these are the three major places of conflict today with the, as they refer to already in the Tehillim and other places, the power of Ishmael, which, which wants to destroy the Jewish people, and they say constantly producing lies, and they make, they, they, they make uh, <coughs> certain agreements in their minds to break them. <coughs> well, we say, <coughs> the Torah, <coughs> represented by Shechem, the Avodah, represented by Harabai, and 
Yavilu Chatzadim represented by Hebron. That uh, we hope that the more historical, correct understanding of these three places will spread to the nations of the world and they recognize that this is the basis of producing the model society of the Torah, Torah Budag Milut Chatzadim. We hope that it's interesting also that when Hashem says, I will remember my covenant with Yaakov, with Yitzchak, and with Abraham, and with the land. So the order is reversed, not the historical order, the other, other order. In other words, the first principle, which can be understood by everyone, is, is by the people of Israel, the difference between Jew and Gentile is the Torah. And we are only a nation because of acceptance of the Torah. And through Torah, we can come to divine service, our connection with Hashem. And through that, loving kindness will be established in the right manner from Avram Avinu. But maybe it's also a reference here that Hashem is speaking about all the suffering because that, 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 when he said, I'm, I'm, I remember my covenant, is the end of the first set of punishments which should come on Israel if we don't keep the bond with him. So he says that Yaakov, he, 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 I'll, I'll, if, there's, if there's any Torah left amongst the people of Israel, I'll remember that. What else is no Torah? The vast majority of the people of Israel don't know about the Torah. They don't even know the Chumash. They may not even know the Shema. They don't know anything. So what will I remember? Is you go to Jewish communities, whether it's in Israel or in, or, in, or in the rest of the diaspora, many don't know Torah, but some have synagogues. So at least they pray. The synagogues might not be opened every day, but they're open on Shabbat. Some have only... <coughs> three times a year on the Shonim Kippur. But still, there's an element of the synagogue worship left. And even if that's not left, but there'll be one pillar which is left, and that's the pillar of Avram Avinu. And Avram Avinu represents Chesed, and the power of Chesed pervades nearly all Jews. There's, Jews, even if they're completely assimilated, but they give per, per ratio much more to charity that's given by Gentiles. The many assimilated Jews, they don't give very much to Israel. They don't give very much for Jewish causes, but they'll give for charity. Chesed, it's also chesed. And even if they've forgotten the way of the chesed of Raham, at the is called, the many Jews, they'll say, I won't give to any charity but I will support Israel. If it's something to, to help Israel to defend itself against enemies, or if it's a hospital in Israel, for that we'll give support. They'll give, they'll give millions for Israel. So that's, that's exactly what we see happening today. Coach Bo remembers every act of goodness that comes, connection to the land, connection to the chesed of Abraham Avinu, and certainly remembers those centers where there is Torah, the center where is Tefillah, and that, all that merit of these three holy places, which de jure are now under the state of Israel, basically. These places, the, even Shechem is under jurisdiction of the Israeli army, so it's still part of Israel. And certainly Hebron, and uh, certainly Yerushalayim, de jure. De facto is different. Practically speaking, even the Rabbayit is under the control of a Muslim group. But let us hope that uh, it will remain, at least as far as the jurisdiction, de jure, it will remain with us. Mietz Hashem when the moderate Arabs will recognize more and more 
the importance of they, their, their point of view of the Quran and Quran traditions should persevere that we'll be able to make peace just like Ishmael made peace at the end with Yitzchak and recognized it belongs to Yitzchak, not to Ishmael, things will be different. I'll bring you a proof also what, what has happened. The proof I bring from, from the situation of um, a peace conference where the head religious leaders of Islam and of Christianity, the head political leaders met together in a major peace conference on jurisdiction of the King of Jordan together with the State of Israel and then and on the jurisdiction of the American president. And this is the conversation that took place, as I heard myself, from one of the participants called Rav Simcha Kuk, who is the chief rabbi of the Chovot and also of the Chorba in Yerushalayim. And so he said like this, he, he was there with the, speaking also to the Muslim clerics, and he said to them, according to the Quran, according to Muhammad, your holy place is Mecca and Medina. And really, Jerusalem, if you look at it, at the, at least the more moderate interpretation, belongs to the Jews. It's not mentioned the holy place for the Muslims. So therefore, okay, we, we came to an agreement, we want peace. We want peace. In any case, we're not allowed to go on the Temple Mount, in any case. Fine, so we made a certain agreement with you. But why, do, why don't you put forward the moderate view make out that Jerusalem belongs to the Muslims, and the Muslims really want to drive away the Jews. So they said, look who's sitting on the platform as your political leaders. We know that many of them don't believe in God, and don't believe in the Bible, and don't practice what's written in the Bible. So therefore we say, it's called replacement theology. We say, Ishmael has taken over from Yitzchak. Because the covenant was, yes, Ishmael, he did, he recognized the supremacy of Yitzchak as long as Yitzchak keeps his covenant with Hashem. Because that time Yitzchak was a big saint and he kept his covenant and he encouraged his descendants to keep the covenant. But since the, the Jewish people, basically in Israel, have left this covenant. Therefore, it belongs to us. As you'll even find hinted in your rabbinical traditions. And it's true. The rabbinical traditions say, Avraham Ahlin prayed for Ishmael. And the rabbinical traditions say that if the people of Israel do not fulfill their purpose in the land of Israel, then it will belong to Ishmael. That was his answer. So let's hope that we will change, we will change and convince the moderate ones that we change so much that they'll be peace with us. And they'll also recognize the Jewish people have done Teshuvah, have returned to God. And such voices came up. You know, in the wars now, with, with Hamas, took a ton, the previous war. There were some preachers, when they saw that so many of their weapons did not reach a target, did not kill Jews, they said, it seems the Jews are now becoming beloved of God, therefore it gives them success. That's what they feel. There is such a spirit even amongst Many of the Muslims. So therefore, we have to follow these these hints and hope that Am Yisrael will do Teshuvah, and as a result, Ishmael will do Teshuvah, and even the Christians will do Teshuvah, and go back to the path of Torah, where we say that. 
אחיו דחי נועה, וכל נציבותיה של all the parts, a part of peace. אמן.